people don't have personal and professional values. You just have your values. I think uh, my advice to founders is your values should show up primarily in your hiring process so that you're screening for folks that are aligned with your company's values. You can codify your values when you're just a founding crew. We, we codified ours when we were three people hiring our first employee. And really importantly, if someone's not aligned with your values, they're not a bad person. It just means they'll be more successful in a different company. Welcome to the Startup CEO Show. I'm your host, Mark McLeod. In this episode, I sit down with Josh Reeves, co-founder and CEO of Gusto, one of the leading payroll software companies for the SMB market. Josh is building a really special values-driven company for the long run. In this episode, we talk about many things, what he got out of going through YC, fundraising for SMB, how to grow an SMB, hiring, the importance of values, how he's built culture, Josh is building a company that he hopes outlives him, and there's so many actionable insights in this episode. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you subscribe for future episodes. Josh, welcome to the Startup CEO Show. How are you doing today? Mark, it's good to see you. Glad to be here. Hopeful we can uh, share some advice and wisdom. I sure hope so. I was really looking forward to this episode and thinking back to many, many moons ago when I first met you, and you were running not Gusto, but the predecessor Zen Payroll, same company, just different name. And was I remember laughing to myself because I thought for the longest time that you just didn't have an office and you were just randomly strolling around South Park waiting to meet with whoever the next person was. And you were just presumably massively over caffeinated because all you did was meet for people in the park for coffee. But I subsequently learned that you did have an office. And so anyway, it's a true pleasure to see you again. It's been a very, very long time. I feel like we have to unpack that story, Mark. Should I elaborate a little bit more? <laughs> yeah, sure. It's one of well, my favorite know. favorite early memories, actually. So so we started the company in Palo Alto, which is about an hour south of San Francisco. But we moved out to the city when we were um, hiring our first teammate. And we were near uh, a small park that Mark mentioned called South Park. Uh, but our office was really more of like a loft. No one lived there, but it was where we worked, where we ate. Uh, we all went home to sleep. And so there just wasn't conference rooms. And so we were less than 10 people when I met you, Mark. And uh, I would do all my meetings, interviews, partner meetings, candidate interviews, all of it in basically the park. We would meet at Cafe Centro. I'd get like a chai latte. Um, and then we just go sit in the park. And, and it was you who I remember said at one point, like after maybe two or three meetings, I think it was tongue in cheek, I hope, but it was like, a, it was, it was do you, do you have an office? Are you like a legit company or not? Cause I keep meeting yeah. you in the park and I was like, I swear, right. I promise you're a legit company. We are building real product. We have real customer. Trust me. Yeah. Do you ever, is it ever a real company? I mean, I got to hand it to you and I, I hope we can unpack this a little bit in our chat, but like the hardest thing to do, the hardest thing to do in any company is, is scale. If you look at the, all the elements of value creation over the life cycle, by far the biggest single slice of the pie is distribution. And distribution is tough in SMB, and in particular, retention is tough in SMB. And I was at FreshBooks when we first met, and we were a much bigger company. And all credit to you and your team, Gusto is now a far larger company than FreshBooks. And so you've clearly done a lot of things right. But I want to start with, you know, and you know, you talked about doing all your meetings and if it's cool with you, I'm just going to jump around. No, we don't, we don't need to go chronologically, but um, maybe this stems from all of your meetings outside. But I remember you telling me that you made many of your biggest decisions around kind of executive hires, investors by going for a hike with people. And I don't know if you still do that, but Tell folks about that and, and why that was your methodology and yeah, the benefits of that. Because I, I, I love it. Yeah, no, happy to unpack. And maybe I'll also note just, you know, grateful to be on the podcast. Um, you know, big part of the tech community when it's working the way I uh, 
kind of admire and respect it working is about folks who don't view it as a zero sum game, want to, you know, pass on advice, learnings, advice. A ton of folks have been helpful to me over the years. And, and I still go to a lot of folks for advice and help. And if I can uh, pay some of that forward and make it useful to folks, um, that's really why I'm excited to be here. Uh, plus, you know, there's also many ways to build a company, which I'm sure we're going to unpack. So my advice is always to a listener, you know, determine what resonates, what aligns with your philosophy, um, and and then, you know, make it your own and make it authentic. Uh, and if it doesn't, then then so be it. There's, again, many ways to build a company. Uh, but to, yeah, the heart of your question, um, for me, that's kind of a deeper question. Like I... I just grew up in the outdoors. Uh, my family, my parents are both teachers. We had summer break. We would go to Yosemite every summer for two weeks, just camp out in the valley. My mom was a nature docent with the Sierra Club. Uh, my brother and I are both Eagle Scouts. We did a lot of camping and hiking growing up. Um, I have four kids now, Mark. Um, wow. Five and under. Their that. names are River, Sky, Canyon, and Ember to map to. Amazing. Or, you know, water, air, <laughs> fire, and water. So anyways, nature is in my blood. Um, and so, yeah, to the heart of your question, I think, uh, you know, really just changing environment is really the heart of it. Whether it's a walk in South Park, whether it's a walk along you know, the Embarcadero. Um, yeah, in some cases, driving to a nearby uh, you know, area to go hiking in the San Bruno Mountains. Or now that I live in Marin, there's a lot of hiking around here. It's not a requirement. I don't meet all people hiking. I, I obviously do meetings in the office as well. But if folks are game for it and want to go have a chance to kind of do a more extended conversation, uh, it's something I learned actually from um, some of my professors at Stanford. When you're on a walk, you can actually have silence much more peacefully, much more easily. You can kind of just be strolling. You can have a pause in conversation. It's not awkward or uncomfortable. And then you can delve deeper into something. Uh, you can also you know, have eye contact, but also not have eye contact at times. And so you can actually just get into, I think, more interesting, deeper topics more quickly than you know, sitting across from each other in a conference room. I um, no longer live in the city. <clears throat> I now live out in nature myself and go hiking pretty regularly and our, our just our property alone has you know three acres and a pond with trout in it and um and we have trails and i'll often go and and walk the trails and you know i'm i'm running a super simple business now you're looking at it. it's a one person business so it's a different reality but i don't know if you find the same thing but I, I encourage my ceos to get out and get out in nature obviously a it's healthy for you but maybe more, I guess, short term, practically, I find that change of context, that breath of fresh air, that exposure to nature just activates way more of their brains, right? That rational brain, that the voice that's going on all the time is just a tiny fraction of actually our potential. And our subconscious brain, intuitive brain is way more powerful. And we're just slamming and going from meeting to meeting and zoom to zoom to zoom. We're leaving no space for that subconscious to do its magic. That's why we have these aha moments right in the shower or, or on a hike. And so do you use it for yourself in decision making or you use it really just for kind of meeting key people? Um, I mean, I'll add to it. I use it by all means for reflection and introspection as well, which is much more of a solo activity. Uh, it could be on a run or, like you said, just literally sitting in nature. Uh, I think a couple more things. One, you just have more senses at play because now you're smelling, you know, you're obviously seeing, you're hearing. Um, if you really kind of get quiet for a moment, you know, there's a much more sounds in nature than most people expect or think of. Uh, and then the second thing I love is like whatever challenge, obstacle, puzzle I might be facing, maybe I'm getting, you know, into it too much. When you're in nature, especially with, you know, where I'm at, where there's a lot of redwood trees, uh, but, you know, I'm sure for everyone, there's trees nearby that are pretty old. Uh, I just kind of do a really quick thought exercise, which is imagine like when this tree was, you know, initially growing and it was small and what was happening around it. And, and often that's 100 or 200 years ago. So it's kind of a fun thought exercise. Um, or where and what will happen 100, 200 years from now? And with that time horizon, whatever challenge or obstacle I'm facing in the moment kind of quickly pales in comparison. And then it's, uh, you know, a little bit less of the, hey, you know, this is a stressful situation and we'll work. Great. Let's break it down. Let's look at, you know, what's working, not working. Let's assess, you know, different solutions, path A, B, C. Let's get more inputs or not. But it's a mm -hmm. action orientation that comes out of it for me. Um, and it's a very healthy way to kind of release some of the, release some of the pressure. 
I love it. I'm curious, do you meditate at all? I've had various times in life where I've done more structured formal meditation. Mm -hmm. um, for me, honestly, just being in nature quietly is kind of my, my present form of meditation. Mm -hmm. yeah, I gathered that. That's, that's what led me to ask. I had that sense as you yeah. were speaking. Yeah. If I go way back to the beginning, so Gusto, or I guess Zen Payroll, went through yeah. Y Combinator. And I'm curious what you took out of that program that, that set you on your path. Yeah, so we were part of YC Winter 2012. The company was started yeah. 2011. And a little back, bit of backstory, uh, Gusto started by three co-founders who are all very actively engaged and committed and full-time at Gusto today, um, which we hopefully will come back to and talk about that, that founder mm -hmm. relationship and how it evolves. Uh, but we had all had prior startups. And so we'll, we'll get to like how we came across the idea, I'm sure, later. But um, you know, we, we were going to tackle this pain point and, and start a business no matter what. We really wanted to, to kind of make this problem better. Uh, but we met with a number of folks, and one of my co-founders had been through YC actually earlier. I think it was in 2008. And uh, we just really liked the idea of going through this program with folks all at the same stage, kind of at that same early seed, kind of build out first product prototype phase of development. And so what we got from it was, number one, community, um, just that shared experience with laser focus on you know, talking to potential customers, building software, and then just seeing each other every Tuesday. You know, that was pretty much our existence. We'd go to the gym every day. We would you know, make meals together. The three of us lived together. And, you know, that was our four month plus kind of existence there early on in the company's history. Um, but we also got a couple tactical things from YC. Number one, we got our early customers because we we're focused on new employers paying their first employee. It was just a unique audience to kind of have um, start using the product from day one. Uh, and two, it really was an accelerant for when we did Demo Day and raised our seed round of fundraising. Um, that process worked out really well for us, which I'm sure we'll unpack as well. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I'd love to, to go there because... Um, uh... I'm no longer focused exclusively on SMB. When I first met you, we, I was. And my experience is not all VCs love venture. I mean, love SMB. Um, even though it's a giant market, but it's, it's, they just struggle for, like, to get their head around how you're going to reach real scale, how you're going to get distribution to work without CAC approaching LTV. They struggle with churn. Um, and so I'm just wondering, I guess at a, a certain point, your success spoke for itself, but maybe in the early days, how did you get folks to get on board? Especially because, and I want to talk about that next, but you've got, you got a lot of tier one investors uh, on your cap table. And if I were to look at their portfolios, they're probably much more skewed to enterprise and consumer and, and much less on SMB. So maybe just for all the aspiring SMB SaaS founders out there, how did you get folks over the hump? I mean, it's an amazing segment, as you and I both know. It's a real, large, meaningful part of society. It's folks that historically haven't had access to great technology and tools. So from a mission lens, like it's been really motivating and inspiring for us and the team of, you know, 2,500 plus gusties to all of us now interact, either have family, friends working in SMB, and when we can see concretely how we make their life better, it's an amazing feedback loop. Uh, but to, yeah, the heart of your question, I think early, early on, I'm going to try to go back to seed stage, early stage, where maybe more of your, your audience is at rather than where Gusto is today. Um, you know, there was two big things we had to prove. Uh, one was, could we build a meaningfully differentiated product? Uh, and again, you know, three co-founders, all of us had studied electrical engineering, had no background in payroll, HR benefits. So, you know, first off, you know, the first four months plus was just literally building out a back-end system to do tax filings, tax payments, you know, direct deposit. Just the ability to run payroll we knew was something we had to get done prior to raising money because we were going to face that question of, can you even build something that works? Um, and we wanted to make sure that we had de-risked that piece of it. So when we got to demo day and we're then engaging with seed investors, uh, we could say proudly we had run payroll. It was you know for a couple of pay periods, but it was money moving through the system. It was taxes being filed, forms, documents. It was money moving, et cetera. And it was done accurately, compliantly. And so that was a really important thing for us to kind of uh, initially kind of check the checkbox on. But but on product more broadly, and what we spent the next year plus doing before we raised our Series A, is we had to prove that we could build a product that was 
incredibly easy to use too. So, you know, it took us a while to build out all of the front end, build out the employee onboarding, build out the ability to run payroll through software, et cetera. But we had a hypothesis and that's maybe my advice to folks is if you haven't done it yet, doesn't mean your answer is, I don't know. What you want to have hopefully is a hypothesis of what has changed in the market and the technology landscape that makes it possible to finally solve this pain point. Because small businesses doing payroll by hand had been the norm. Small businesses getting fined and penalized by the government was the norm. Close to 40% of companies in the U.S. every year got fined for incorrectly doing payroll. So the pain point was really obvious. Um, and, and that wasn't sufficient, right? It was like, hey, can you build something that people are going to be able to use, set up, and adopt, and then love so much they want to tell others about? Um, so we had to prove that. That was kind of a big bucket. And then the second to maybe the heart of your question too was we had to prove out that we could go acquire folks in a cost-effective way. And for that, also early on, it was a set of hypotheses. We had hypotheses that with really high customer love, we could leverage organic, right? So SEO, people searching and finding gusto organically, but also through referral, through social. So two big ingredients were necessary, like Google and Facebook. Not products or companies we created, but that didn't exist 20 years prior to Gusto. Actually, we started Gusto 2011. Didn't even exist close to you know 10 years prior to Gusto. Um, but we felt those were ingredients that enabled uh, finally this audience to be uh, uh, accessible in a more cost-effective way. And then the other big technology trends we were bringing to bear were paperless, mobile, and cloud, which also were obviously things we didn't create or invent, but made it possible to create a product that anyone could use, set up in a browser, enter some information, go run payroll and go, wow, it's that easy, right? It's that simple. Um, but until we built it and showed it, uh, those were all hypotheses. Right. Makes sense. I remember studying the SMB payroll market when I was running my investment bank and realizing that um, there was probably a venture fundable TAM just in the churn that ADP had each year. Uh, I don't know if that's still the case, but did you know at the time that there was a big dinosaur you could go after or you just knew it was a pain point and therefore we're just going to go and try and solve it? I think there's a pitfall for earlier stage kind of companies, founders to get too caught up at times in competitors and incumbents. Like, because if you really think about it, right, three people, you know, back to the early founding who had never done anything in this space, you have like a, you know, $75 billion company, you know, they're a hundred billion dollar company. Like, well, what chance do we have to go do anything against them? And, and the reality is we didn't even think about them too much. And that was actually a good thing because I think if we had thought about it too much, we would have found all these rational reasons that this was not a real opportunity. Um, but one thing that really helped for our segment, and maybe is the same for a lot of other entrepreneur segments, is that it's actually a really fragmented market. So if the incumbent has 90% market share, I do think probably it's a different ballgame. But in our case, you know, just looking at, at payroll, because we now do many products uh, helping small businesses, but uh, payroll, you add up the three biggest incumbents, ADP, Paychex, and Intuit, and they had, you know, 50% or less of the market. Um, and so you had a huge long tail of folks doing it on pen and paper, working with their accounting firms, doing it manually. Those were a lot of the folks we met with and talked to early on when it came to you know user research and interviews. Uh, and we were just shocked because we were like, of course, everyone uses some type of system. And it turns out, no, like 40% of folks were doing it by hand still in 2011. And that's when we got really excited because then it became, hey, let's go build something that is dramatically better than pen and paper. Let's go prove out that it can be a scalable go-to-market driven by organic and word of mouth. And then, you know, even to this day, a big, big part of our growth is from that greenfield. It's from folks starting out and or shifting off pen and paper onto Gusto. We also do get a lot of switchers from some of the incumbents as well. But it wasn't that day one, we had to be obsessed with poaching from an EDP. It was, let's go build a great product and have folks finally move off of that pen and paper uh, pattern. Yep. So many similarities with FreshBooks. We were also competing with pen and paper. Into it, it did eventually, you know, look down and think about how they could serve our segment. But for many years, it was really competing against the status quo. I'm curious when you talk about serving brand new businesses, I'm curious about how you identified them. Like I think about MindBody, kind of an old example, really kind of went deep in the yoga space. and uh, But they literally were sending direct mail. They would figure out, oh, you just registered a new yoga business. Like they would go to wherever it is that you find that that has happened. 
and literally send a physical mail to to that studio owner. So I'm curious, how did you identify brand new businesses that could be clients? So once we launched in December 2012, and up to that point, it was more of just helping friends, companies prove out the system, make sure that, you know, it was something that we felt could be, you know, if you gave it a fire hose of traffic, like could actually have self-serve, easy setup, easy run payroll, you know, obviously be accurate, compliant, but also customers would love it. Um, so we launched December 2012. And in that first month, we added 100 customers. And the vast majority we had never met knew um, and we're not near physically us at all. They were all over California. And so that's when we really knew we were onto something interesting. So it was really two things we did to drive go-to-market early on. And there's still really big parts of our go-to-market today. Uh, first was really try to, you know, almost programmatize that organic flywheel. So word of mouth, referrals, great customer experience, easy to share, you know, tracking leads coming in through word of mouth. We would see pockets where like all of a sudden, you know, like five churches in a small town in Southern California would sign up. And we're like, I think someone probably talked to like a conference yeah, yeah. and like said, I use Gusto, you should use Gusto because we definitely didn't do anything targeting churches in that town. Right. Um, and so there was, you know, PR as one piece of that. There was mm. uh, amplifying word of mouth as one piece of that. And then it was really optimizing that onboarding conversion setup process to be as easy and smooth as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and we didn't actually start doing paid acquisition to drive direct top of funnel till about a year after going live uh, because we really wanted to prove out the organic piece and then augment it with the paid piece, which I think sometimes founders get off. Mm -hmm. If you jump too quickly to paid, you don't know really what your unit economics are or they're just bad. And then you have to really have high confidence, otherwise it's just gambling, to, yep. to think about how do you scale a system when your unit economics aren't great. Um, so direct became a big focus. You could kind of call it inbound um, if you want to use a dragon term, but it was all about that inbound, vol high volume, low touch, uh, more self-serve dynamic and lead volume mostly coming again through organic. And then some about a year in uh, paid acquisition through SEM, et cetera. Um, but the second big program we also launched early on was working with, with the accounting firms. We had met with mm -hmm. a bunch of these accountants and bookkeepers. And uh, for them, payroll had actually been one of the products they were doing often by hand and not as a uh, joyous thing, more as a no. necessary <laughs> kind of thing that their customer was making them do. Um, and they didn't like it. It wasn't a really great margin business or product for them. And so when we came in and said, hey, you know, we can actually be that product for you. Uh, you'll get all the credit. You know, you can be the hero here that brings a modern smart solution to your client. Uh, you know, that actually resonated really quickly. I would go to accounting conferences, then we built out a sales team. It was still, I would say, mostly inbound, but we were higher touch in that relationship because as we added accounting firms, then we would have one, two of their clients on Gusto, but over time, it could be 10, 20, 30 clients on Gusto. And right. today, we call that our Gusto uh, Pro kind of platform. It's an indirect channel. And you know, we have over 15,000 accounting firms that are a part of that That's amazing. Uh, effort. Um, I remember seeing you at some of those conferences in Vegas and I was yeah. at least a CPA. So the content was interesting to me, but kudos to you for toughing that out. You I remember you and Jelly there, but, um, when I look at my experience trying to navigate that same channel, I'd say we encountered a lot of resistance. Uh, when I think about, um, it's probably got a different name now, but it was like the pro advisor program or something in the time into it like quickbooks was synonymous with the category like they couldn't imagine i think it's the same reason why zero struggled in the us a into it is a phenomenally well-run highly competitive company but when accountants thought about accounting software they just thought about quickbooks now i'm wondering because into it had a payroll product it's nowhere near their emphasis but did you have to overcome similar resistance I, mean, I think it was a different ball game on the accounting side, mostly because of how dominant QuickBooks' as market share was with small business and even with some, you know, missteps as they transitioned from desktop to cloud. They did make all the right decisions more than not. And, and ultimately that kind of closed the window for some of the startups to kind of capture that opportunity. Um, I think there's a whole other set of opportunities in that space, but that's not our focus at Gusto. I think what we had is a little bit of luck, frankly. You know, the reality was payroll was more of a side project and add-on for QuickBooks uh, into it. 
And so that gave us a chance, you know, as our entire focus, as our entire wedge, as our primary product until we added more things like benefits and time and retirement savings, et cetera. Um, but also, I think, you know, frankly, uh, ADP and, and paychecks were less, uh, I would say, present and, and locked into that community than they could have been. Um, and so, you know, even today, we have um, more of a partnership and competition with Intuit. You know, we export from payroll into the GL for QuickBooks or Zero or whoever uh, someone is using. And and obviously, from a QuickBooks payroll lens, we're, we're fairly competitive. But um yeah, I would say it clicked pretty early on, and then it became more choices on how do you structure the program and how do you scale it. Uh, we gave folks rev splits so they could, they could well, not rev split, we gave them a discount, basically a volume discount. So as you added more clients, you could actually lower your pricing, thinking that more like wholesale pricing, or you could just literally uh, pass on that, that discount to the small business owner. But there was really strong product market fit, I would say, with accountants early on. And, um, you know, there's other examples like that. I think Bill.com had a pretty good similar story when it came to to fit with uh, more of the APAR pain point. Yep. So I've been, I've had my company for nine years now, and I've been a payroll customer uh, with the same vendor for nine years. But it's sort of like set it and forget it. Uh, maybe update the salary once a year, or I'll add a new employee back when I had employees. But otherwise, I'm not in it. And so I'm wondering how important user interface is that the reality for your 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 customers and if so how important was user interface for for gusto given that i'm not in it all the time you know yeah i mean i'm going to guess too you probably have one of the easier use cases so i sure uh, do <laughs> you know, sa salaried um not having lots of employee turnover Correct. you know we found actually um the us especially is more like 50 countries not 50 states mm -hmm, so you have mm -hmm. You know, lots of complexity at the local, state, federal. So a company that has three employees, but multi-state faces a lot of challenges there. If they have benefits and they have a dependent, there's obviously the updates and enrollment processes there. So um, ease of use mattered a lot because we have a pillar we call peace of mind. Like all of the complexity we want to abstract behind the scenes. Um, you know, business owners don't start a company because they want to be really good at how to submit a form to the government. That's right. um, they, they, if they don't do it, they might get fined or penalized or shut down. So, you know, that whole umbrella of work for us is about taking several hats off the head of a business owner. And I love it when we send an email to our clients on a quarterly basis and it says, hey, here's all the quarterly filings you need to do. We did them all for you. Have a wonderful day. And, you know, you can <laughs> imagine our, our customers <laughs> love, love that email as well. Um, yeah. So there's a whole basket of stuff there that, you know, as we've done more around HR compliance and 401k compliance and workers' comp compliance, like compliance is a gigantic category of headache for business owners. And our goal is actually to abstract all of that compliance mm -hmm. and keep broadening and expanding what we do there. Mm -hmm. um, and so if all of that's behind the scenes, what's what's left in the product for the customer to use? I would argue it's actually also very important things. It's, you know, adding an employee to your company, right? It's choosing what pay to set for them. It's choosing if, you know, how much you can spend on benefits. It's they have a child and it's adding a dependent to the system. So we think of these as more life moments. Mm -hmm. One of our biggest early hypotheses, which I think has been proven fairly uh, positive thus far is like, the system to the customer should not, cannot come across as this kind of cold, you know, sterile transactional system mm -hmm. because you're actually doing very human things inside the product. If all of the complex stuff is being abstracted, the, the product is about people. Right. So and true. so having there be that warmth, that humanity be present, not just in the software and the design, but also if you interact with us and our teammates, whether it's through chat, email or phone, um, that's also something that we really felt would be a way to stand out, frankly, because some of the incumbents had taken more of that transactional approach. And I'd say today that's been a big part of our, our success is really viewing it, Gusto as a partner. Like if you're going to be a subscription-based business model, this is my advice to any company that's in the SaaS space. Like if, if your customer is going to be paying you for the value you provide, potentially indefinitely, that can mean five, 10, 20 years. I can't think of a better term than partnership. It's not a tool. Mm -hmm. It's not just a, a transactional system. Like you deliver value, they pay you for it. If you don't deliver value, they leave or churn. That's a wonderful feedback loop to hold a company accountable to actually creating something useful and valuable over you know the long term. Mm -hmm. um, that's been just a big part of our ethos on how we approach you know product development, customer interaction, uh, company building, et cetera. 
so funny. So you now run a company with 2,500 people. You now are a father of four children. But as you were speaking there, I'm having flashbacks because even when you were 10 people and I thought you were some homeless vagrant in South Park, <laughs> you spoke with the same values and the same sense of mission yeah. and the same sense of privilege, how privileged you are to serve these customers. I'm curious, where do those values come from? Uh, values is a whole topic unto itself. I, I really love this this broader category. Um, some things I'll just put on the table and then I'll get to where my values come from. I, I think values, people don't have personal and professional values. You just have your values. I think uh, my advice to founders is your values should show up primarily in your hiring process so that you're screening for folks that are aligned with your company's values. You can codify your values when you're just a founding crew. We, we codified ours when we were three people hiring our first employee. And really importantly, if someone's not aligned with your values, they're not a bad person. It just means they'll be more successful in a different company. Um, and so we have values at Gusto like service mindset uh, or a lot of this customer centricity that I'm sure is coming through. Um, you know, for me, you know, I'll go to, to the heart of your question. Like I, I was raised by um, teachers and you know, big part of that profession is uh, not, you know, pursuing a career for fame or fortune. It's about the desire to help others. Um, and so that was just an example I had from day one that really became ingrained in me. Uh, this you know, idea of a big part of what gives me joy and, and, you know, it was an idea and then it became reality it is helping others. Sounds simple, but like truly that's what gives me a lot of satisfaction and, and pride and if I finish a day and feel like I did something that helped either a teammate or helped a customer, like that's a good day for me, right? And if I haven't, that's a that's a harder day for me. And so, um, I think that that comes a lot from you know upbringing, family, et cetera. Um, how it showed up early in Gusto and why it did was you know a little bit of, of I guess unique to our journey. Like we had all had prior startups, and I'll be the first to say, you know, this isn't me from birth having like values as a core philosophy for how I do company building. I didn't know anything about company building. I didn't know anything about startups. Um, you know, I didn't even know a lot about, you know, science and technology. My my dad was a humanities teacher, high school, English, history, social studies. My mom was a Spanish and French teacher. Um, and so, you know, the journey into math and science and engineering was was much more, you know, personal and, and self-directed. Um, at Stanford, I got a lot more exposure to tech and startups and the ability to kind of use technology to solve big problems at scale. But it was actually our my prior startup where I experienced, you know, a different way of company building where we didn't have purpose. We didn't have a core value system. We were just building product from day one and making some money and going, where does this go? Where does this go? You know, and, and it was actually reflecting on that, you know, introspection, you know, bunch of hikes, walks in nature for, for several months after my last startup, before we started Gusto, where I was able to reflect and conclude that you know when I had been most happy, most fulfilled, it had been when I really had purpose around a mission, you know, something I wanted to solve, make better. And it was actually a nonprofit in college that I used as a reference point uh, that kind of gave me at least an example when I had you know been in my my best state of like output and, and productivity in my own opinion. And so you know when we started Gusto, we we did go in with this headspace. Maybe it's somewhat the benefit of just being second time founders, but like we wanted to tackle something where the problem was really really clear. We had to prove that we could build something useful. We had to prove that it could scale and that it was a real business. But like we really wanted to tackle something we could spend decades, the rest of our working life, trying to make better. And that was a due north from day one that this is going to be a multi decade journey. And when you have that headspace. You know, caring about the what and the how is kind of logical, right? Caring about like values and how you hire is logical because it's going to set the foundation. You know, five people set the foundation for 10, 10 set it for 50, 50 set it for 100. Like it's much harder to go back and have to transform or fix a lot of stuff. And we've had plenty of things where we have to go back and make changes. But, but if you're more intentional with things like values early on, um, it saves you a ton of time later. This episode is brought to you by Bello. Bello is the only AI meeting management solution that covers every part of your organization's meeting workflow. Go to fellow.app slash CEO to get 300 free minutes of AI recordings and start having better meetings. I think values are super important. You know, um, and I think they are not fully lived in most companies, but I, I actually think 
the root of any disagreement, any miscommunication is ultimately a value that is either not being lived or just not articulated. We, 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 we haven't codified it yet. So I think they're that important. I get the sense that you are a very kind and caring person. And so I'm wondering how disagreement shows up in the company, maybe particularly at the leadership level. Maybe talk to me about that. Um, well, I am I who I am. I think, you know, I'm trying to be an example of like one can be kind and competitive. I was a competitive rower in high school. You know, I, I love winning. I have a younger brother. There's a lot of fairness and justice parts of my upbringing that manifest in how I approach leadership and company building. Um, but yeah, I think there's there's a couple of lessons here that might be useful to folks. So first, at least at Gusto, we we have deconstructed. There is a difference between being nice and kind, in in my opinion. Right. Because kind is about seeing the bigger picture, you know, wanting to, you know, win, not at the cost of someone else uh, per se. But like being kind means giving direct feedback. Right. If someone's not doing well. Right. Like they need to know that. Right. If they don't know that, then they're not going to have a chance to grow, learn and develop. And if there is a disagreement on strategy or, you know, path A, path B, like the kind thing to do is to debate it, right? One of our values is debate and commit, right? And so I think there is a pitfall. Nice sometimes can seem like avoid conflict or avoid debate or avoid disagreement. I think that's a pretty quick path to actually not being kind because then topics get swept under the rug or important things might fester. And so, you know, Augusta, we try to manifest really raw, direct, you know, as objective as possible, break down a problem, share the pros and cons, highlight an issue, let's deconstruct, let's problem solve, let's see what's working and what's not working. We try to kind of run the whole company through that lens in terms of how we use OKRs today. Um, but but yeah, you know, kindness shows up as like, we want each other to be successful. We want the company to be successful. We see how the pieces come together to help all of us better benefit. And I think a lot of times, you know, if you hire, again, we have a, a low ego kind of component to how we hire. Like we hire people that really, really want to advance the mission, really want to help others. And so, you know, we get uh, as an outcome, I think, a, a population that um, is kind and competitive, you know, can be ambitious, but also have humility. I don't think these concepts are oppositional. I think sometimes they're debated these days in an overly simplified way is choose one or the other. Um, all I can say is, you know, Gusto is full of people that are incredibly ambitious really competitive, want to provide the best possible product. But but again, focus on the things in our control, right? Like I get asked sometimes about, and I'm sure we'll talk about landscape, ecosystem, competition. It's good to know what's out there, how it's changing. But I want our attention, our time to be focused obsessively on how we make our product the best possible product for our customer. And if we're off, how we learn from that and close that gap. And, and that's, again, to me, where, where we spend most of our time. I love it. Your results speak for themselves, so I kind of know this question, but I'm gonna, or know the answer to this question, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Does that approach do you find does it result in, I don't know, more time talking and making decisions? Do you find it creates any slowness, or do you find actually because you're being direct, because you're being fully authentic, it's actually the opposite? So I think any approach out there, and on many topics in company building, you have. Lots of just different approaches, right? Like there's companies to go to org structure that are more functional, more GM structure. Uh, there's companies that are much more, you know, tops down or decentralized. The reality is these are all spectrum topics. No company is only one or the other. And every one of these things, you know, have pros and cons. We call them shadow sides. So I would say at Gusto, uh, one thing I really like is that we, on any issue, debate, topic, you know, I would say almost never are wondering what's someone's real motivation, right? Like we know across the board at Gusto, the motivations are very pure. You know, we really all care deeply about advancing the mission. We want to make it easier for entrepreneurs to start companies. We want to make healthcare more accessible. We want to improve the employer-employee relationship. These are the pain points that bring us together as a team. Um, now, on the flip side, you know, we do have to navigate all the corresponding trade-offs around like how how does the company get organized? You know, how do we dis, you know, dis design different swim lanes? Who has decision authority over what? How do we resolve conflict? Um, one of the shadow sides, I think, can be, you know, uh, that nice dynamic, which again, we've, we've worked through quite a bit, uh, where, you know, is the goal to make everyone happy? Uh, I would say very strongly, no, right? Everyone being happy just means consensus, just means 
average mediocrity, right? So even when we look at, you know, scorecards for candidates, I, I much prefer to see yeses and nos versus just a bunch of yeses. I want to see a few strong yeses. I want to see a debrief where there is discussion around what this candidate would bring, how their spikes map to the needs we have in the organization. But on core values, you know, we do have a binary filter there. If someone's not aligned with our core values, uh, they're just not going to be a good fit for Gusto. They're going to be more more effective and successful elsewhere. So yep. we're always trying to hone and, and iterate on this. We would hope to be an example of of uh, speed. And I think some of the things we navigate at 2,500 are just harder because of scale. Uh, right. But I still think we're early in the journey. I still think of us as a startup. You look at market share, you look at what's possible. Uh, we're definitively still just early. We could grow mm -hmm. 10, 20, 50 X where we are now, but we have a lot of work to do to get there. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, I'm curious, do you look for people who are similar to the people you have? Like if I stereotype, let's say you had a candidate who crushed it at Uber under Travis, would you be like, oh, that person's not going to be a fit because our culture is just so different? Or are you curious and you'll go through the process. I mean, we have some great folks at Gusto who came from Uber. <laughs> so okay, there you go. <laughs> I'd say, I'd say even, even a company, like whether you want to, you know, talk about Uber, there's many people there that either map to that culture or don't map to that culture. And that culture has, by the way, changed a lot, obviously, under there. It has, for sure. Um, and so we really try to take a person-by-person -person approach to it. We screen for values, we screen for motivation, but along every other dimension, company background, experience, you know, geographic, you know, exposure, um, you know, length of time in the workforce. Uh, frankly, I think diversity is a great thing. It gives us perspective. It gives us new ways of thinking about stuff. Our customers are incredibly diverse. And so if we don't have a team that maps to that, we're not going to build a great product for mainstream small business. And again, maybe the audience is, is already aware of this, but like we are tackling mainstream small business. There are more right. dental offices in the United States than there are tech startups. And so yep. it's, you know, every zip code, every town, it's the you know true distribution of small business that Gusto is focused on. And it's just an incredibly diverse customer set. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, we touched on a lot of elements that I would throw under the heading of culture. And, you know, for many CEOs, culture is at least partly synonymous with being in an office. It's not the same. Not, culture is not a foosball table, but, you know, there's something about the space you can create when you get people under one roof. And I remember coming to visit your office and being told I had to take my shoes off and being handed a pair of Gusto socks that were very colorful, Argyle. They were awesome. And... um you know, now the world's kind of different and, and very less office centric. And so I'm curious how you've morphed in your practices and be able to kind of keep this, these unique elements, right? It was very unique to walk into your office versus other offices that I would go see. And I'm wondering, have you tried to replicate that in a virtual way? Yeah, I'll try to share some learnings here and, and we can talk about that tradition, which is a fun one. It's changed a lot, obviously, <laughs> post pandemic, but um, I really think of this category as traditions, and they should form organically in a company. They mm -hmm. generally aren't done tops down. It's something that just resonates with the team and then kind of catches like wildfire and then becomes a part of the culture, like you said. Um, and and they're also, you know, it's not, speaking about office, it's not, the goal is not to be unique. The goal is to be authentic. And like, for us, we started in a house. We were all raised by our parents to take our shoes off in our houses. So we were clearly taking our shoes off in, in the place we lived. Um, we had our first Gusty join. That was a tradition in his family as well. Mm -hmm. We moved to that loft I mentioned near South Park. Uh, we were there from four people to about 20. Um, every person joining was like, I want to keep doing this. This is, this is, you know, comfortable and what I prefer. And so, yeah, to be clear, we, we scaled it with like slippers and socks and right. giving people <laughs> like flexibility. Um, but the whole idea was, you know, there's outdoor and there's indoor and they're just, they're just separate. And, yeah. and that became just a part of the culture. We opened our Denver office. We have cubbies, you know, we, we passed out socks and slippers to folks as they came in. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it just, again, was something that resonated and was authentic. And, um, I would say it was something that, that became a tradition. Yeah. Uh, with the pandemic, everyone being at home, obviously people can do whatever they want in their own home. <laughs> Everyone's and in then, socks. <laughs> you know, whether it's in socks or shoes. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people obviously 
do wear shoes inside. Um, that's mm-hmm. their choice on their on their own home. But uh, when we started coming more into those that are near an office, back into the office, I'd say some people today um, still do the the shoes and or socks and slippers, and some mm-hmm. wear shoes. So the tradition mm-hmm. I would say has uh, tempered a bit, um, cool. and that that to me is okay. Right, traditions again should should form organically and also um, evolve organically. Um, there are teams within Gusto. This is now my mental model. Like, should a tradition affect 2,500 people in many locations, many offices? That's kind of hard. Mm-hmm. But, you know, should the time team, you know, have a tradition for how they do their stand-up meetings? Uh, I hope so. And I hope it mm-hmm. forms organically and I probably am not even involved in it. You know, should the team that in New York, you know, loves coming into the office is where we have kind of the highest in-office attendance. You know, there are some unique New York traditions for that space that, that I think are fantastic and wouldn't make sense in San Francisco, for example. Yep. So to me, you know, values we talked about, traditions we just talked about are two big ingredients to culture. And um, again, they're company specific, but uh, ideally when you're looking at your company, you know, entrepreneurs that are listening, if you have no answer to like, what are your values? What are your traditions? Then there is a pitfall here to, to kind of just be the average of all other companies. And that's probably not yep. an ideal place to be. Agreed. No, for sure. And the best people can choose to work anywhere, right? And so it's not about yeah. pay, right? It's like, I have the luxury of choice. I want meaning. I want purpose. I want a place where I belong, right? So you can't just be, I have to know that I belong, right? I can't just yeah. be this bland copy of everything else because I'll just get bland copies of everyone else working with me. I mean, with with the uh, you know some of the changes to the future of work, you know, there's a dystopian view. That's my my own editorial. That work is you know all just going to become transactional. It's purely about compensation matters, but the dystopian view is it's the only thing that matters, and every company is interchangeable, every team is interchangeable, and it's just you know whoever you know is the highest bidder, and that's a dystopian view for me because. Uh, I just see concretely through both Gusto, but also through our customers, how work can be much, much more than a paycheck, right? Like paycheck matters and it should be aligned with impact and and absolutely in a tech startup, you know, the bulk of of the benefit of our progress and the reward goes back to, to employees in terms of things like equity, ownership, et cetera. But, um, but, but more than anything, like there's also a purpose around like, you spend a lot of time at work. Like, wh- what are you doing with that time? Like, who are you helping? And like, is it is it meaning something to you? And then also, there's like this community component, which we've been alluding to. You know, you you can you meet people through work, whether it's virtually or in person. Obviously, our small business customers are mostly doing it in person. And like, these are either your neighbors, these are people you get to know, they might know their family. And so there's already not just the paycheck piece, but there's the purpose piece, the impact, the helping others, the community piece. And and it's also just a huge part of your hours in your day, hours in your week. So, you know, I'm heavily in the camp and it's a big part of our product philosophy. How do we help companies, you know, navigate this topic around, you know, surfacing the, the human side of running a business, not just the PL, right? PL matters. We can talk about financial and transactions and cash flow, but like the human part of running a business is always going to be something we gravitate to with Gusto, um, both because of our product and because of our, our core values. Right. Well, I certainly hope that dystopian view doesn't come to pass. That's for sure. When I, you know, look at, you know, the quote unquote successful companies in the tech world. And when you read about them in the press, there's this cult of personality. Like, you know, Shopify has got 10,000 people, but the press write about Toby, right? not the 10,000 people. You read about Meta and it's Mark Zuckerberg did this. Mark Zuckerberg did that. And I feel like you deliberately keep a low profile and you don't even refer to yourself as CEO. When I was like looking you up on LinkedIn, you're head of Gusto. And if I were to describe your leadership style from my sense of it, I would the term I would use is servant leadership. And I'm just wondering, so a lot of that, I guess, runs counter to... Um, how many of these other companies do it. And so I'm just wondering, first of all, does that resonate? Is that an accurate description from the outside looking in? And maybe if if you do describe your leadership style as servant leadership, maybe talk about that. Because I, I think like maybe people would be curious about it. 
Yeah. So, I mean, first off, I would say, you know, to me, it comes down to motivation. My goal is to be of help to my team, be of help to our customers. You know, I couldn't care less when I'm 90 if my name is associated with Gusto. Um, you know, frankly, you know, to me, life is the journey and like how we live each day, each moment is where I want to more than not, I'm not perfect by any stretch. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, feel like I'm, I'm giving and contributing and, and getting energy from what I'm doing. And for me, that comes down to helping others. Um, I would like to say that maybe somewhat challenge the premise. Like I think there's a silent majority of a lot of tech founders, CEOs who have this same mentality. I don't think it's that unique. You mm -hmm. know, it's a focus on the customer, build good product, you know, try not to get too caught up in the echo chamber, you know, you know, do it for reasons that, you know, again, put the customer on the pedestal, right? Like that kind of feels mm -hmm. logical to say, because that's why a company exists. Gusto doesn't exist for our benefit. We exist to go help our customers. Mm -hmm. And I actually think a lot of folks generally take that approach. Um, maybe the folks- Can I, can that, I say that something there? Be, so first of all, I yeah. agree with you. I think many founders have that, that root motivation. I think the difference is, and to be clear, I have spent zero days working inside Gusto. So this is just me filling in the void. But I see so many CEOs who are omnipresent and they're in the critical path of every major decision and in some ways become the bottlenecks of their companies as a result. And the company can actually only scale to the extent that they can keep doing this. And it's often what brings them into coaching because they burnt out through their own, mm -hmm. through their own efforts. And, you know, You've got 2,500 people, you've got four kids, and I'm trying to look around. You don't have a lot of white hair yet, so I feel like I got, maybe you're not some, putting yeah. yourself in the critical path of everything. And so I think maybe that's the distinction. You're enabling people, yeah. but I think you're probably empowering people to make a lot of decisions. Is that accurate? Yeah, no, I can unpack. I think these are also spectrum topics to be, to be more specific. Like I've had to grow, evolve my role dramatically. You know, when we first met, I was wearing many hats. I was, I think, just shifting or had just shifted off of like writing code still to like being our main salesperson, our main marketer, you know, being really focused on like all parts of, you know, running the business while my two other co-founders were focused more on the engineering product side. And so, you know, many, many chapters in scaling and growing. Um, I've worked with a coach, which I think is a fantastic practice. You know, my, my reminder to anyone out there, if you haven't explored that concept, it's like, you know, LeBron James has a coach, Steph Curry has a coach. If you like basketball, name any sport, people at the best of their field still have a chance to grow, learn, improve. And so there's nothing uh, weak about having a coach. It's actually quite the opposite to me. It's an amazing enabler to, you know, add another tool to the toolbox. Self-reflection, introspection is great. I leverage my board for growth. I leverage my executive team for growth. And I think working with a coach is a great way to, to complement all of the above. Um, so some things I navigated pretty quickly was, you know, how am I going to scale in a way where I'm, I'm uh, you know, living a meaningful, fulfilling, happy life. And that's all personal to define, but, but happy for me means like, you know, spending sufficient time with my kids, you know, getting enough exercise, um, obviously, you know, helping it gusto reach its potential and, and advance on its mission. And so some of the tools, I guess, that, that I developed, maybe that's worth sharing um, number one is, you know, you got to just mental model has to be, and it sounds simple, but, you know, big part of the job is, is bringing in incredible talent and giving them the chance to go run key initiatives, projects, activities. Now I play a key role in what is the, we, what we call Augusta, the operating mechanics, right? Like what are those swim lanes and, and what is the role and accountability and, you know, who has decision authority? And, and I definitely can't and I don't want to shirk my duty to play a very strong role in setting up that part of the process. And when we reach impasses on things and something gets blocked, there is an escalation path to me, but how often is that happening, right? It's a good feedback loop. And if it's happening too often, then there's something off in terms of how we've set up our structure or the leadership team we have, or am I really living into my ideal, which is, am I getting involved because I'm needed or am I getting involved because I want to get, you know, you know, involved in some micro-optimization that might not be worth it in the grand scheme of things. And so these are all topics I've had to navigate. I, I continue to navigate. How do I compartmentalize better is another big bucket, right? When I'm doing one thing, do that one thing at a time. Otherwise, multitasking is a pretty quick path to doing a lot of things pretty poorly. Um, and, and then, yeah, being present, which is kind of what I just alluded to. So, you know, serving leadership for me is is just all about like putting the customer 
at the forefront and then realizing that any product company you know developing is is based on the people they are delivering like every single customer care rep picking up a phone call talking to a customer every engineer writing code like that is the building of gusto and and my job is to kind of try to set up the potential for folks to reach their potential in that process um and, and you know get out of the way otherwise i love it um as we start to wind down, I want to ask you two more questions. Uh, first of all, I want to go back to, we talked about your co-founders at the beginning of the conversation, and you're now over 12 years in. And I, um, I recently had Toby from Shopify on the podcast. And Shopify is a great example of a company where all three active co-founders were crushing it in C-level roles at the time of IPO. Two of them have stepped back, so now it's just it's just Toby, but that was their choice. It wasn't like they were booted out. They didn't become VP of special projects because so they, they couldn't keep up. And anyway, that's the case in your company as well, right? Your your two co-founders continue to crush it in, in, in senior roles. And so I'd be curious for your thoughts on, I guess, first of all, how you have, I guess, collectively uh, grown as founders and um, how you manage the founder relationship, perhaps separate from just actually how you lead the company with the rest of your leaders. Yeah, I think there's kind of parts of this that are intentional, parts of it that are just like luck. And and then there's definitely some watch outs that I have uh, advice here for how to navigate kind of the evolving founder relationship. So a couple of things I'll put on the table. Number one, founder relationship, if anyone wants to use an analogy is like marriage. Um, and like like marriage, you hope you grow together, um, but there's also the potential to grow apart. And so, you know, what I would say, that's the luck piece is 12 years in, like the mission, the motivation, why we care, and also the need to keep growing, learning, and up-leveling our own skill set. You know, that's the thing, right? It's not favors to have a founder in a role in a company. We have to keep, me included, growing and becoming the best we possibly can be, fill our knowledge gaps to be able to then be uh, the right leader for this next chapter in the organization. Uh, but those have been things that myself and my founders have been able to navigate. And that's part of why we're, you know, 12 years in, still very involved, engaged, and uh, closely connected at the hip in, in building Gusto. I think one tactical watch out is, when you start shifting from just founders as the leaders to having a broader leadership team, um, definitely make sure you don't create a shadow leadership team dynamic. We were pretty intentional. When we started adding other leaders, we would have a leadership team meeting or a Gusto staff meeting. And like, I didn't want to have that be a meeting. And then on Sundays, me, Tom Renetti chat. And that's actually when real decisions get made because that would just undermine the folks joining, right? Like this is a leadership team. Tom and Eddie are a part of it, but let's have those discussions, those debates as much as possible with these other folks in the room. And so I really um, think that was a, a very important uh, approach we took. But also don't forget, there is a unique dynamic at play in scaling where as founders, you are going through this unique journey that only each other can relate to, where you know this is not a job, it's kind of more of a purpose, it's something you might do for decades. And so when we interact, we still do that on a very structured, regular basis. It's much more as a support network, more as a sounding board on life topics and sharing than trying to replicate our executive team staff meetings. Um, and, and that's, I think, one of the most beautiful parts of the relationship today is, is being there to support each other. And if you can get the ingredients to line up this way, and we're not the only company that's done it, like having a founder who's, you know, has credibility, has trust, is super connected to the business, you know, might be responsible for one thing now, something else later, uh, is really a superpower of a company. And, and I actually look up to Intuit. Scott Cook is a great example of this, who's someone who really was able to, for decades, have meaningful impact on the company because that founder DNA actually gives you a chance to kind of really make meaningful changes in a company um, without you know, questioning as much the motivation of the person, because with the founder, you know that they're they're really just obsessed with how to help the company achieve its mission. Yeah, I love it. That's so great. I'm curious. You clearly don't have a lot of free time, but like, do you uh, do you guys hang out socially? Do you get together not to have a you know a business discussion? Yeah, that's kind of what I was alluding to. Yeah, most okay, of our good. business discussions are in the work context. So when we yeah. get together, um, it's usually just to like go on a walk, a run. You know, uh, 
go work out, exercise, which has been a routine Maybe. for us for a long time. Um, or it could be a retreat where we go away for a few days and that's just more shared experience uh, as friends and often with family. Um, we even have some unique stuff that was totally a surprise and mm. I would be shocked if it's happened elsewhere, but I, I think it'd be amazing if it did where our parents got to know each other really well. Our no parents way. do trips together. That's the mothers so will cool. go do adventures and um again that's all just to me icing on the cake of mm. of like people that that have this underlying shared value system creates the potential for those types of relationships to form i love it final question um it's funny in some ways you're you're a lot like shopify on this toby for almost forever has talked about building a hundred year company like building for the long run you also have talked about building for the long run and so i'm curious how you have navigated that with the idea that while well, VCs are not in it for the long run per se, right? They have to get in and get out. And has that been, has that created tension along the way? And uh, I presume this means you're going to be a masochist and ring the bell and go public someday. I don't know. Maybe just talk to me about what it means to, to build for the long run versus building just towards an exit. Maybe just to be really tactical on the VC piece, um, you know, VCs generally have these 10-year fund structures. We fortunately have some investors who've evolved to also hold public equities, but uh, more so than not, you know, there is going to be turnover in the cap table for, for any company that raises money from a VC. And the tactical advice I have, which we acted upon really starting in 2018, 2019, is when you're at that leader stage uh, of the journey, um, you know, we shifted towards public equity shareholders, right? So Fidelity, T. Rowe, these are mutual funds. You know, their investments in private companies are really about starting to build position, but with the goal of, you know, building much bigger positions in the future. And these are uh, funds and structures that, that can hold if you perform. There's no favors here. But if you live into your potential and can compound for a long time, you know, many of these uh, funds would love to have a 20, 30 year position. And it's kind of one of the things they'd be most proud of is, you know, what that meant in terms of their, their funds, uh, portfolio return. And so, um, I think that's a tactical thing just to know when do you shift from seed investor to a VC kind of series A investor? When do you shift from a series A investor to a late stage? And when do you shift to more of a public equities crossover investor? And you can be pretty intentional about that process as a founder versus just, you know, wait and see what, what happens. Um, in terms of the long term question, like to me, it, it really just starts from not what I want. It starts from, this is such a big pain point. There are so many adjacent product lines, right? So we talked a bit about benefits or alluded to it. That's a huge, huge set of pain points that we want to really move the needle on in terms of making healthcare more accessible, affordable. Um, there's a bunch of stuff around time tracking. International hiring is a newer product mm -hmm. from Gusto. You can hire international contractors in over 120 countries. And so there's just a lot of additional things for us to build, pain points for us to solve, you know, customer market share for us to go win and, and businesses to go serve that to me backs into why this is going to be a multi-decade journey. Yep. Um, and, and then, you know, are we ever done? And, and the reality is, you know, we happen to be in one of the just biggest markets out there. So, you know, I, I aspire Gusto to absolutely be a company that lives long beyond me. But as long as we're providing value, as long as we're solving more pain points, not just for the sake of it. And, and yes, to be clear, that means we're going to be a public company at some point. Um, no, no timeline to share in a, in a public right. forum here. But um, that to me is just a milestone in the journey. And I'll quote a CEO that told me when they went public, it was like, you know, high school graduation. You got the rest of your life afterwards. Mm. Um, it's a milestone. It means something. There's obviously a component that, that matters a lot from a... Um, you know, liquidity of the stock for either M and A or for you know employee liquidity. Uh, but on the flip side, like we're building Gusto to go help businesses, and I'm sure there will be you know just as much market share for us to pursue after that milestone than frankly before. I love it. Well, Josh, it's been so great to see you, albeit remotely, again after so many years, and I couldn't be happier for all the success that you've generated and. Um, I'll definitely be cheering you on when you ring that bell. That's for sure. Thank you so well, much for making time to be on the show. No, my pleasure. And I hope the advice was helpful. Cheer us on when we pass, you know, a million small businesses. That'd be the milestone that I would savor. Amazing. Seriously. I love it. 
Hey, thanks for listening to the Startup CEO Show. If you'd like to connect with me, be sure to visit my website at markmcleod.me or follow me on LinkedIn at the Mark McLeod or Twitter at markmcleod underscore. And if you want to tune in again next week, be sure to subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you next time. Thank you.